the this session. I am Nikki Cruz, and I am the mother of Dylan Cruz. She is nine. She was diagnosed with Bang Ridge Roper syndrome at the age of five in 2018. Um, and I wanted to speak to you guys a little bit about uh, the specialized therapy that that um, Dylan has been participating in since the age of four and a half um, with econ therapy. And she. Um, I don't know. I'll get the slide. Okay. Keep going. Um, yeah. <laughs> there's, there's slides, I think. Um, uh -huh. I think they made them this way. Maybe Julie can help us out. Thanks. Um, so we discovered the equine therapy through the suggestion of Dylan's physical therapist. Um, and Dylan is hypotonal, so she has low muscle tone. Um, and very poor balance coordination and um, uh, agility and um, things like that. Her, her core is, is fairly uh, weak and it's getting stronger. But uh, with, the, with the horse therapy, uh, her physical therapist um, thought that it would help her uh, not only build her core strength, but also um, help with her speech. Uh, oddly enough, the uh, tongue is a muscle, and so when our children have low muscle tone, yeah. the uh, core strength with all the diaphragm and the muscles in the stomach, I'm not a medical expert, but um, and then how it talks to whatever muscles it needs to in the neck area, and then obviously with the tongue um, to enunciate and communicate words. So we chose to start uh, the, the equine therapy at the age of four and a half. Dylan rides at a place called Inspiration Ranch um, in the uh -huh. Houston, Texas area. And she, um, their minimum age to start riding is age four. So there's various facilities across the US. I'm not exactly sure worldwide what the resources are available um, for equine therapy for um, children with disabilities, but um, she started riding at the age of four and a half, uh, with the minimum age being four. So it could be earlier, it could be later um, in, in your area. Um, I will say that we had women start uh, speech therapy at the age of 18 months. So from the age of 18 months to four and a half years, she did improve somewhat but there really wasn't, we didn't see a huge improvement of her uh, speech abilities. Um, however, after a few sessions with horse therapy, she started to say simple two to three word sentences. Um, the most significant one was, I love you. Um, I actually heard her say for the first time about seven or eight sessions in. Um, she rides for 45 minutes to an hour weekly. Um, she continues to do so. In Houston, it gets super hot in the summertime, so she only rides about eight months out of the year. They don't ride during the summer um, to give both the clients and the horses a break. So um, I've got some pictures behind me. Um, the one on the far left, that's Dylan's very first lesson um, when she was riding Frito at the age of four and a half. She's pretty tiny on that big horse. Um, and she rode Frito for about two years and then he retired. Um, the middle picture is uh, on a horse called Roni. And that was um, when Dylan started to learn a little bit more about controlling the horse herself. Uh, and they, you can see that she's riding backwards. So the equine therapy, they, they do various different goals. So they help build um, the core strength, the balance, the coordination, they'll do um, different activities. They'll put her backwards on the horse. She'll be out like airplane doing you know, numbers like this to try and um, you know, just gain balance while being on, on horseback and really strengthening those core muscles. Um, and the picture on the top right, that's her horse now, that's Jenny. And um, she just started riding Jenny uh, in the spring, or the start of the spring semester in January this year. So um, she's doing amazing. I don't, um, 
I just wanted to share our experience with equine therapy because I don't think that it's a real widely known um, therapy in our world of the ASXL um, uh, syndromes. And uh, most, there's a lot of places that do therapy yeah. writing for disabilities and you just kind of have to stand up and shout to see if they will accept your application. Um, if your child is non-ambulatory, they, I highly recommend looking into it, um, as the horse's gait is very similar to a human's, um, and so when the child or the person is on um, the back of the horse, the sensory neurons to the brain, um, with the human's hips, with the movement of the horse's hips, uh, it, it kind of trains the brain that, oh, this is what my hips and legs should be doing. Um, and so we've seen, uh, Dylan, Dylan started walking at the age of 23 months when she started the horse therapy after she was ambulatory. Um, so I can't speak to um, if the horse therapy would have helped Dylan um, learn to walk because she was walking previous to that. So I do want to mention that caveat, but I also want to mention that um, throughout the years at the ranch, um, like I said, we've been there for four and a half years, that Dylan, um, we've seen clients that were non-ambulatory that are now walking. Um, some of them are walking with assistance, of course. Um, some of them are walking freely. Um, some of them work, walk with um, assistance and, you know, AFOs or SMOs or, or something like that, some assistive devices on their actual body themselves. But um, I, I guess I'm just here to say and share our experience that um, if you would have told me, that, you know, four and a half years ago that a horse can change your life, I probably would have scoffed and said, you've got to be kidding. Um, this is this is not um, like what they eat hay like whatever, um, but uh, truly honestly, you know Dylan has um, really excelled with her experience um, in horse therapy, and uh, we're just blessed that we have that organization uh, that you know is close to our home, and they also um, offer uh, subsidized riding. Um, it's very expensive, um, unfortunately, to keep the animals. Uh, fed and um, with, with the veterinary costs and everything else um, and when it's a non-profit organization um, that runs off of fundraising things can get kind of expensive so we're very fortunate in the, the fact that our facility um, does offer subsidized riding um, so it's a you know, significantly reduced cost to, to our family um, so with that I will um, I don't know do I save my questions till the end? Or? Uh, Melissa, do you know? Or we, I think we're doing. I think we're doing all three. All three, yeah. yeah. And then we'll have questions at the end. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Hi, I'm Jamie Ordauer. I'm mom to Asher Ordauer, who is going to be seven next week. He was diagnosed in uh, 2018 in January. And I'm gonna just tag on a little bit to Nikki because I actually grew up on a horse farm in Michigan and grew up riding. So uh, equine therapy, hippotherapy, therapeutic riding was not new to me. It was, uh, it was something that had been, there was a riding instructor that I had that she started an organization. So this was, in the back of my mind, I knew it was a thing. So when, before we got Asher's diagnosis, I actually, called this woman and said, hey, can we come talk to you? And went out to her barn, which is in Michigan, we were back visiting, and uh, she met Asher and she said, well, therapeutic riding, it's, we have to be four, you can't, you can't do it yet, but there's another thing called hippotherapy. So there's a, there's, it's such a slight difference. Uh, hippotherapy, you have to be a, a licensed PTOT or speech therapist. And honestly, they don't actually have to know anything about horses to do it, but they give the therapy on the horse. And then the therapeutic riding, um, I think Nikki had the, oh, it's not up there anymore. Nikki okay. had the, um, the website for the PATH, right? It was the PATH certified, you had that website up there. Mm -hmm. So yes. for the therapeutic riding is the, you really wanna look for the PATH certified instructors or the PATH certified, um, it's up there now. Um, you wanna look for that because those are gonna be, be the people that have the training and the knowledge and the skills to really move your kid forward and to really help them. Um, and hippotherapy is hard to find, but if you do find uh, PATH certified instructors or you find an organization that works with PATH certified instructors, 
they should be able to help also find somebody that maybe also does hippotherapy if you're looking to start a little earlier. So Asher actually didn't walk at the time <coughs> that we started it. I am not going to say hippotherapy is the thing that made him start walking because he certainly we've had OT and PT and we had been on that path for a long, long time. But like Nikki was saying, the way that the horse moves and the way that the human body moves is very similar. So when you're on the horse, the horse can walk hundreds of steps in the, the course of that half hour that you're on the horse and your body's moving, so it's teaching those muscles what it needs to do. It's really just phenomenal. And I personally think that any connection to an animal is an amazing connection for a human, for a kid, for, um, for anyone to just sort of make that the connection between sort of, I guess, the emotional connection that they're making is, is wonderful, whether it be a horse or be a dog. Um, they're nonverbal communicators, and most of our kids are nonverbal communicators, so it's kind of amazing. But I also wanted to talk a little bit about music therapy and aqua therapy because those are the other two things that we have done with Asher. So we started aqua therapy with him when he was, I think he was two, and we haven't done it in a while. Aqua therapy is, is, is tricky to find. We live in New York City and it's tricky to find somebody that has access to a pool that's going to let a therapist use it that's going to be uh, affordable. So we haven't actually done that in a while, but one of the things that aqua therapy sort of taught us with him is that it's such a great sensory thing for him he can move his body more easily through the water. So whether he maybe couldn't bear weight at the time that we were doing it, and he didn't have the strength to stand up and to pull himself up, but in the pool he could do a lot of things. He could move his legs in a way that we couldn't, he couldn't move them on solid ground. And the water is such an amazing sensory tool for him that he still uses. When Asher is having sort of a challenging day, even if it's in the middle of winter, sometimes we'll just throw him in the bathtub. We'll fill the bathtub up, we'll throw him in the bathtub, or we'll turn the water on and we'll let him play with the water. If it's summer and we can turn on a sprinkler or we can put out a kiddie pool, it's such a calming thing for him. And he just, he really loves it. He really it just sort of speaks to his, his soul. And he, if he's got the opportunity to be in water, that's what he's gonna choose to do. So the, uh, the aqua therapy, again, it's a little tricky to find in New York, but I sort of suspect it's easier to find outside of the city in different places. Um, and the person that we worked with was a PT, and then through uh, New York University Hospital, they have a, um, an aqua therapy program that you can get into that their person is a, um, an occupational therapist. So it's really great. If you do whatever you can find, if you body and, and help work the, the fingers and the, the legs and get some motion going and um, it's great. So my favorite one, well my favorite one is hippotherapy, let's, let's, let's be honest, I get to play with horses too. So music therapy is the other sort of non-traditional therapy that we do with Asher and we, I didn't even know it existed, I didn't know it was a thing, all we knew was that he loves music. He has a musicality to the way that he talks when he is sort of communicating with us. You'll hear it's the intonation sounds like language, but it's very, very musical with him. And we have played music for him and we have sang to him. And if you heard Annika last night, you know that like this is what he loves. He loves music and he really connects to it. So I think it was his occupational therapist at the time, she said, have you ever considered music therapy? And I said, no, I don't even know what that is. So she said, well, I think that there's a program actually near you in Brooklyn, so take a look and see what you can discover. So we looked it up and there was a long wait list to get in for a therapist for music therapy. And he's been doing it now for, I think he got in in the summer of 2019, and then he did it for like six months and then we had to take a long break. 
doing music therapy. <laughs> so what music therapy has done for us, he, the repetition of the songs and sort of the language that you get from singing or the, the way that the, the instrument sort of moves up and down and, and in and out um, is a lot like language. And I'm not gonna, he doesn't talk, he doesn't have a lot of words, he has a, a couple here and there, and we feel like we get more from him when it's musical. And so his music <coughs> has, has really helped with that, and, and we, we have songs that we'll sing and pieces of music that we will try to play with him. And this for us has been a great way to, to get the start of language with him. So Daniel in particular plays a really funny song with him. He does the Miss Mary Mac, 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 if anyone knows that from back in the day. And so he'll, because it's repetition and it's fun and he will get the last word. So he doesn't, he can't always say the last word, but he'll do enough of an approximation of it because it's really fun to him that you're singing this song and he's engaged and he's playing with it. And so he's like, oh, and this is the next word I'm going to give it to you. And you're going to continue the song and it's a lot of fun. So for music therapy, we've been fortunate that they do, there's a, um, I don't know if OPWBB is universal, or if it, no, it's not, Daniel says no. So we are, it's a program through New York State that we can get, uh, you spend years trying to go through the program, but you can get money that can help for community classes or respite or things like that. And so they're able to work with your people uh, in the OPWDB that can help offset the cost. Uh, we go through Brooklyn Conservatory's music, they do a lot of scholarships. So if you can find people that do music therapy, and I think it's I think it's around, I think that there are a lot of places that have it, and I think it's, uh, it's wonderful. And uh, most of the places I believe ultimately end up doing scholarships because the families that they deal with they know are already dealing with a lot, and so they do the best that they can to, to help people out. And we also know that our the, the organization we work with for the therapeutic writing does a lot of scholarships, and they get a lot of scholarships through the city that they can then push through the organization, and then they have a lot of fundraisers and, and get a lot of money that way. So there are ways to offset the cost. Um, it's like everything else we do, it's a lot of research and a lot of advocating. Oh, there's Asher's pictures. Yeah. So there's Asher playing the piano, and then he's sitting in the water. Oh, sorry, <laughs> we get back to it. I don't know what I just did. <laughs> and then this is one of the, this is this spring. This is one of the most recent um, uh -huh. hippotherapy pictures of him, and that's Peter Pan, which is the horse that he's riding. <laughs> Because we have a variety of abilities and our, you know, the, a lot of symptoms. So we, I, what I was going to talk about um, first is uh, <coughs> called the Anat Danielle method. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of that, but the idea is that um, in order to help our kiddos that sometimes have attention problems, does that make sense? Like, so a lot of our kids we talked about in the sensory class earlier. Um, Izzy is like a sleepy Sammy, right? So she has a hard time paying attention or understanding what's going on. And, um, and it also works with kids who are like a little crazy. So in order to get the attention of the brain, because you're not going to get learning unless you get attention, you go very slow with your movements and slight variations every time. And you pay attention. So it's actually fascinating to me. It took Izzy from not using her legs her legs were completely low, and she would not give me any feedback on them, any pushing. And then I laid her over top of the ottoman and was able to kind of do this with her legs, and she started standing after that. Um, she would, like, very quickly, because you'd move them, and then you'd pay, but you have to pay very close attention as the person moving them, because as soon as her muscles would fire, 
you would immediately react to that firing so that they learn that any little tiny firing, that's, that's what you want to do. That's what's going to react. Um, and they use it with more advanced kids as well, but this is how we used it with Izzy. Um, she doesn't stand right now because she's got a broken femur, but <laughs> generally speaking, um, she can. And that's, that's how we got her to be able to do that and to do a lot of other things, drinking out of a cup, putting her glasses up, it's all on that basic idea that, you know, our minds have like ruts that they run in. And in order to get out of those, you have to kind of, you, you have to do something different, you have to do a variation, and you go slow, so that they, but with attention, um, so that they can, and um, so I don't know, um, it's, it's been a game changer for us though, and it's called the Anat Vandale. If anybody's interested, you can kind of look it up. There's tons of practitioners here in California. This is where it actually originated. Um, and we were able to find some practitioners even out where, where we lived. And, um, and then the way that they do their therapy sessions is actually very different. Instead of going once a week, you go two hours a day for three days so that you can get the, uh, because the, the idea is that kids learn in bursts, so you do that and then you give them a couple of weeks to kind of practice on their own and then you come back and do the same thing. Um, because I think most of you guys, I don't know if anybody, anyways, if there's any questions, I can answer more questions about that, but I don't want to go into too much detail if everybody is at a different level. <laughs> um, and then this is just, um, trying to think, the only other thing, let's see, does Jaden communicate pretty well? Do you guys already have something for that? We do, she's nonverbal, okay. but she um, uses some switches. Uses some switches. She, the iPad device, which if she has too many choices, it's-, it's um, Too many. Too okay. many. Yeah. All right. So the simpler, the better. Absolutely, so this is pretty simple. This is actually, so Izzy has cortical visual impairment, and so because of that, she struggles with visual things. And so we do what's called auditory scanning, um, and our therapists help us to put together kind of just like a, a basic, if this kind of, so we start by asking her four questions. Like she'll, she actually grabs our face and to tell us that she wants to say something. And so then we'll turn to her and we'll ask her, you know, do you want to do something? Do you have an owie? Do you need to use the bathroom? Or what was the other one? Do you want to eat or drink something? And she's got yes and no signs that she does. Um, and then it would depend on which one she signs yes to, we'll go through, like there's a whole, you know, what's next on the list and then down from there kind of a, uh, and that's also been a game changer for us. Izzy was very much not able to communicate very well at all. And we went from that to, um, I just have to share this story because I just think it's awesome, but it was because it was pretty early on when we had just barely started the auditory scanning, we weren't sure how much she was getting. And she had, um, I had a therapist over and she turned and just kept touching my mouth and I was like, okay, sweetie, what is it? And we started going through things. And finally, it took us some time because we didn't have this yet. We just were kind of asking her random questions, right? Trying to get yes or no answers. And, um, and we finally found that she had her sock. She told us that she had an owie and we went through the whole body and we couldn't find it. And we finally, she said it was her foot. And I took her sock off, and you know how sometimes like their toe gets bent the wrong way? And that's what happened. And, um, and it was just thrilling to me that we were finally able to communicate to the point where she could tell us what was wrong, because it's not huge shit with our kids. And they can tell us, you know, my tummy hurts or whatever. That's just absolutely huge. So um, I will leave it at that for mine because of the, and if anybody has any questions, then I can, um, there's certainly a lot more to it, but I don't want to, go into things that maybe aren't relevant to the crowd, you know? So, if you guys have any questions, you can go ahead and ask. Or, yeah. Um, going back to the point of therapy, are you doing like speech therapy as well? Are you like giving commands or can you touch more on that? And if you all can repeat the question back for the people oh, yeah. on the live stream, that would be helpful. Yes, yes. So, in your own words. Yeah, yeah, so the question is, um, with, the, with the equine therapy, were we um, supplementing with uh, speech therapy as well? And yes, so Dylan has been in speech therapy since she was 18 months old. So I, I don't want it to seem like the equine therapy is like a magic bullet that's going to, you know, um, all of a sudden, you know, somebody's kiddo is, is going to talk that, that they haven't. Um, so we did supplement through 
um, you know, she's, she's, she has speech therapy and then she has um, equine therapy, she's also in physical therapy, and she's also in occupational therapy. She's been in PT and OT since she was nine months old, speech therapy since she was 18 months old, and equine therapy since she's been four and a half. So we're still continuing, even though we continue to see the progress and she's doing so well, we're, we still continue. She hasn't graduated from any of those programs um, as of yet. Um, so yeah, so I, and I also wanted to caveat, I, I mentioned um, that you know, we threw her up there on that horse when she's four and a half, and you know, she's quite tiny. But these organizations through the PATH accreditation um, uh, organization, they will have sidewalkers and lead walkers and a certified instructor. And the certified instructor goes through and as best they can um, the medical history and the goals and you know, get a good plan of care and um, identify what goals uh, Dylan will have on the horse and, um, you know, and go from there. Sometimes Dylan will just have a ground lesson um, and you know, learning just, she's learned personal hygiene kind of through helping with the horses just on a ground lesson with the, with the brushing and the, um, you know, making sure that they have something to eat and this is how we water a horse and this is, you know, this, they, deserve, they have the same kind of care that we do. Um, and they need to be fed and brushed and their um, hooves cleaned and you know, that kind of thing. Um, she's not cleaning hooves, of course, but she's brushing and, and um, feeding a snack and things like that. Yeah, so the question was, um, are we setting up goals um, similar to an IEP um, that you, you know, kind of continue to, to move the target? And yes, so uh, the difference between an IEP and, um, you know, with the educational system here in the U.S. versus what Dylan's, um, at, the, at the range where she rides with her goals, is there's no time, they're not they're time bound. Um, and so it's just, uh, you know, we, we wanted to get her talking. Um, and so that was one of the goals to try and just increase her core strength to see if we could aid in the um, delivery of her words. Because she did make basic animal sounds um, when we started uh, speech therapy. So she, she, like I said, from the age of 18 months to four and a half, we went from saying nothing to basic animal sounds. And then she just, you know, by the grace of God and through horse therapy, I, I swear my life. <laughs> you know, she, she started talking not too long after we started the horse therapy. Um, but yeah, they're, they're very similar goals, um, but mostly based around balance, coordination, agility, core strength, um, those types of things. And they're not time bound. So it's just as she reaches them, then we kind of move the target to something else. Um, also learning how to ride. The ranch is um, really interested in having Dylan participate in Special Olympics. Um, and representing the ranch uh, someday. Um, so we're trying to get her to the point where she can control the horse with her own movements, you know, being able to pinch the horse with her legs, telling it, you know, um, to walk on and to whoa, and, you know, um, the reins, you know, the coordination of the reins, the left and the right side, and, you know, those types of things. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. So the question was, um, you know, there are some of our kiddos that are uh, quite impulsive and throw themselves around, and so um, there's kind of a, a fear of, you know, being being that high up on horseback and um, having, of course, the, the child fall to the ground. Um, yeah, so I will be the first to say that there is risk in that, um, and they are very, um, they're very transparent at the ranch to, to indicate that. However, um, I. I can't stress enough doing the PATH, path accredited uh, um, locations because 
they go through the extra safety precautions to really truly understand um, that to the best of their abilities uh, what our, our kiddos what they go through. Um, Dylan is fairly impulsive as well. Um, she throws herself back. Um, she shakes her head from side to side. She wobbles. She does this. Um, and they actually work on emergency dismount drills. Um, and, and so uh, there's um, once a quarter. So every three months, uh, Dylan has to do with her uh, side walkers and lead walkers. Uh, Dylan has graduated from side walkers. She doesn't have side walkers anymore um, because over time, your core is going to be strengthened and so I mean her I don't know if you can tell from the pictures that I posted up there but um, her posture is a lot better from when she first started to when she's riding now um, but every three months they go through an emergency dismount um, lesson and so it's all it's like all hands on deck when if, if something were to occur or if a medical emergency were to occur with the with the child on the back of a horse all of those people are trained to know exactly what to do um, and as a matter of fact, one time when we lived in Florida, Dylan was at the ranch, and um, this is a different location. We live in Texas now. Um, she was at a place called Freedom Ride, and uh, the horse got spooked um, and bucked up on with Dylan on the back, and she did not fall to the ground because those people knew what they were doing. So they got the horse calm. Dylan was calm. Of course, this, the lesson ended right then. Um, and I was definitely afraid that that was going to be the end of Dylan's wanting to get back up, but she, she wanted to go right back. Um, so yeah, so there, so there's, there's that as, as well, um, that the, that the horse, you know, could get spooked from, from anything, a, a noise, a, you know, a cat running through the barn, I mean, whatever, it can, it, it can happen. Um, but we've been riding, like I said, for four and a half years, and Dylan's been kind of almost bucked off one time, but that was it. They, they, they study the horses. The horses are matched to the client. Um, that's another important piece that I probably didn't mention, or if I did, I probably breezed through it. Um, so the horses are matched to the, to the client and, and their abilities. They're not going to put rodeo stock out here with our kids. <laughs> They're just not going to do it. Um, so these are, these are horses that are um, specifically um, vetted for the, to be therapeutic for, um, for therapeutic riding. The one time we took my daughter when she was much younger for riding, they had smaller like miniature horses and stuff too. So they're not all like you know you giant tall horses. I think they were often trained in variety of the horses. So yeah. Yeah. So yeah, a lot of the they're not all giants, so they're really great with picking um, like Asher has been on a pony essentially since he started because it's easier for the sidewalkers, it's easier for him, it's easier for them to get him on. But uh, in regards to the horses, my dad likes to call them bomb proof because most of them have been, this is what they do. They're like a service dog, but that's they've been trained to do it and sure they're an animal and they can always get spooked and something can always happen. But these horses know what they're doing and they're pretty hard to face. So I, and the people are pretty hard to face. Like they've seen it all. Before Asher was even born, I actually volunteered with the therapeutic writing program in New York. And they see everything. They see every ability. They see um, every, like they see everything. And they do an assessment. There's some kids that they can't put on a horse. Like if they don't, if their spine isn't gonna take it. Those are usually the, the biggest reasons that they're not gonna wanna put somebody up there is if they feel like Medically, they, they their bodies just can't take it. So that they'll look at very carefully. But I don't know what, um, what the place in Texas is like. I know New York is very nitty gritty, down and dirty. So we, we, we don't necessarily have all of the, the cool things uh, as we ride in the park. But the woman that I worked with in Ann Arbor actually designed the lift that they use. They can get anyone on a horse, um, any size, any ability. They can do it, and they're uh, they're really confident in what they do, and they will let you know if they think that it's not going to work. I don't know if this is appropriate or not, um, but CBD oil is we use that, and our son stopped getting seizures. He only had one seizure after we started, and then they put him on a black skin, and he was comatose. Um, 
your question is like, so the best, easiest way to do that is if your doctor will prescribe it, then you can get, it's called Epidiolex, and it's through, um, and Epidiolex is an FDA approved version of the CBD oil, and so it's covered by insurance, and it's been shown in studies to actually help with the seizures. So that's what I would recommend, is going with the FDA approved version. This is another option. It's a lot more expensive, and there's a lot of strains out there. And so, you know, so if, if you have um, good insurance, then then I would ask if they could give you a prescription for the Epidiolex. We found uh, we were spending hundreds of dollars a month before the Epidiolex came out, and um, we we use Charlotte's Web, so that's the one option if you didn't want to do it yourself. That's that's the one that seems to be more seizure oriented. But then, um, once the epidiolex came out, it was nice not to, you know, not to have to spend that extra several hundred dollars a month. Do you want to spell that? Epidiolex, it's E P I, so epi then D I O L E X, epidiolex. <laughs> Did you find that the switch between the Charles Web and that epidiolex? Did you see any differences? Did you in the I was, so I was actually really worried about that, but um, no, it was just a, an easy switch. It didn't seem to make a difference at all. Yeah, so just through the insurance company, and yeah, I know if you're paying for it out of pocket, you know how expensive it is to get the levels that our kids need for seizure control. So. We do, uh, we added Kefir on eventually. Uh, we didn't have to at first, but after puberty, she started having more seizures, so we added Kefir, and now okay. Yeah, you were on Kefir, but um, and it didn't start the same day, but I didn't know that it was illegal or made us on. So that trouble for that one. Then we had to switch on back to uh, like the one blocks and then try to calm them down a little bit too. Gotcha. Um, Seriously reduced Isabel seizures and got them under control when mm -hmm. if we rescue rents were no longer working for 